Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Homegrown Hopes podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Rachel Hester of Whoopsie Daisy Farm. I'm so excited to have you on, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Yes. So you're going to be talking to us today about dairy sheep. If you felt the pull to slow down, to create and cultivate a more homegrown life that's simple and fulfilling, and to truly enjoy the magic of ordinary days, then friend, you found your place. I'm Caitlin. I'm a barefoot, Blue Ridge, homegrown mama, and this is the Homegrown Hopes Podcast. We'll chat about everything from gardening and scratch cooking to homeschooling and motherhood. With some sarcasm sprinkled in, of course, because I am my daddy's daughter and Lord knows I'm fluent in that. Just know that whatever it is we're discussing, I am by no means an expert, and I'll never claim to be. I'm just sharing my experiences the good and the bad, and making the most of the little moments in between. I'm so excited you're here, and so humbled that you've chosen to follow along and hopefully join me in cultivating our homegrown hopes. I'm yes. so interested in this. Um, <laughs> I know there's so much talk around adding a dairy animal to your farm, yeah. and milk cow seems to be the way that everybody goes which is a large animal <laughs> to, to <Yes>. ask. <laughs> um, so maybe give us a little bit of background on yourself and then we'll dive into this. Sure. So uh, my husband and I started our homestead about six years ago, I think. So before it was cool. Um, like, <laughs> yeah. Before this like, came the trigger word here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, well, we didn't even use the word homesteading at that point. We just said we were farming because we're in Kentucky. And um, I remember a friend of mine was like, so how are things on the homestead? And I was like, I'm not Laura Ingalls Wilder. I don't have a homestead. I have a farm. The same way. I'm so. like, I have a homestead in convention and podcast, and I don't love that word. I just don't know what <laughs> word to use. <laughs> I know. I mean, it, now I'm used to it, but yeah. you know, at the time it was like, we're this is a small farm. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> So we did, you know, the, the entry level drug of chickens. And then I got into ducks and to geese and, um, we were trying to have a farm business and it just was not taking off because in our neck of the woods in Kentucky, everyone has chickens. I mean, everyone raises their own turkeys. Ducks were not popular. Um, and so we were like, well, you know, we were doing this for our own nutrition. Uh, my husband donated bone marrow right after we got married and it just wrecked his health. And so we got into this because we needed a consistent source of clean food that he could eat. And, you know, we'd find places that were producing food, but they would either have a health issue with their animals or they get out or they'd have their own health issues. And so we were like, if we want to eat this way regularly, we have to either move to Europe or make it ourselves. So <laughs> My husband opted to make it himself. There you go. <laughs> I was fine with the Europe option, but <laughs> right, Italy sounds good. Let's go. <laughs> um, so I, I had actually lived in Europe in Romania on the mission field for a right. while. So that's actually where I had tasted sheep milk products for the first time. Um, and I, so I just kind of had in the back of my mind, like you know, someday when we're rich and we have our hobby farm, we'll raise sheep. And I knit and I spin, so I'll have them for my hobby and then we'll get some milk out of them so anyway so fast forward we have this this homestead and we were looking into like well, what's something we can do to have farm product to help offset costs because you know it's well, not are never cheaper <laughs> to produce your own food even then before everything exploded so um we were like well you know the next animal is goats obviously because everyone knows goats are easier and smaller and all the rumors yeah. um and so we were signed up to get a starter flock of goats and we were supposed to pick them up in Virginia in March of 2020. Hmm, what a year. What a time to be alive. <laughs> and I, I don't know what happened to them. They just, the starter flock disappeared. Like I've had people be like, what happened to the goats? I'm like, I don't know. We just, they, they were gone. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, then, then the toilet paper shortage happened and people were like starting to stockpile and, you know, my brain, I'm thinking, Mullen grows in the side of the road. If I need toilet paper, I'll go pick some mullen leaves. Like we can't eat pasta anyways. So we're not going to stockpile that. But I was like, you know, we've got eggs. We're getting milk from the Amish, but like, what if they have to crack down? And, you know, we don't really have a source of red meat just in case. I mean, in Kentucky, everyone deer hunts. So that's might not be very feasible if the wheels really come off. So, um, 
I started window shopping just to see what small animals were around. And I found these two border luster sheep. And I said to my husband, they're an hour away. You know, this gives us some kind of an insurance just in cases. Um, and he's like, okay, well, let's go get them. So on Mother's Day of 2020, we went and picked up two border luster sheep, which um, when I was doing research on them, historically, they have been used for milk, but that's all I could find was just a little blurb, like they've been used for milk and it didn't say who milked them or <laughs> any other information, just they milk, you can milk them. Yeah. So we brought home two and we just noticed that where we had them, the soil was improving, the grass got greener. Um, I mean, they weren't really trying to escape. Like they were very docile. They were easier to manage. And my husband's like, I don't, I don't think I want to get goats. I think I want to just invest in more sheep. I'm like, okay. So, you know, we got our stimulus check and supported local, you know, <laughs> economy, boost that economy. <laughs> right. Exactly. This season of the Homegrown Hopes podcast is brought to you by Ransack. That's R-A-N-N-S-A-K, Ransack. And this company, it's really unique. It is a family-owned and veteran-owned company. It was started by my sister-in-law and her husband, and I absolutely love the idea behind this. So this is the first of its kind. It is a peer-to-peer -peer rental marketplace. And basically what that means is you can rent out the items that you have laying around your house collecting dust. I mean, think about all of the stuff that is in your garage or in your basement. I know I personally, since we are in the process of moving into our forever home and we've been living small for two years, it's unbelievable how much stuff we have that we very rarely use. We don't want to get rid of it because we need it once or twice a year. The rest of the year, it's collecting dust. And what Ransack does is it gives you the opportunity to make money off of the items that you have sitting around. And on the flip side of that, if you're someone who needs an item just for the weekend, or for a special project, you can rent that item from your local peers and not have to purchase it and then leave it sitting around your basement to collect dust. So some of the items that are available to rent on their website, kayaks, paddle boards, tools, camping supplies, hiking supplies. I live in an area that has a ton of natural resources and mountain biking trails and hiking trails and lakes and rivers and all of the things. And it's really nice to have the opportunity to rent the equipment for a new hobby and see if it's actually something that you're interested in and want to invest in before you buy all of the equipment up front and then decide, you know what, maybe I'm not a mountain biker. So if this is something that sounds interesting to you, please go check out their website because I just think it's the most amazing concept. Just a wonderful way to one, earn money, earn extra money on the stuff that you have laying around to save money by not having to purchase tons of equipment that you may not need or just renting it for the times that you do need it. And then also it has the really unique benefit of reducing consumerism. Think about how much stuff we buy that, like I said, we really don't need all the time. How much better would it be to just rent it, use it when you need it, and then send it back? So I just absolutely love this concept. If you are interested in learning more about their business, please be sure to visit their website. Again, that is R-A-N-N-S-A-K dot com, Ransack. We got more sheep. So we got a couple dairy mutts and then we got some um, heritage breeds just because I wasn't really sure what we wanted at that point and it was more what was available and who would let us on their farm to get them so true um we bred all of them and then spring of 2021 we had our first slamming and i started milking them and so that gave me a unique perspective because most people who get into dairy of any kind if they need more than one they go to one farm they get one breed and that's just what their experience is versus with me I had a huge variety of breeds. I mean, I had some dairy, I had some non-dairy, I had heritage, and they all had different temperaments. They all had different butterfat content. They had different milk volume. They had different personalities. And so I was able to kind of see like, you know, if you want sheep milk and you don't have access to the proper breeds, you can still get sheep milk. You just kind of have to manage it a little bit differently. So, um, I just started talking about it on the one Facebook board that existed at the time and um There's no information out there available for this. It was not there was nothing. Like if I wanted information, I had to go talk to people overseas on on social media because you know there was one Facebook board and you could get some information from that, but I mean these were just other little small farmers and stuff. Like no one was 
really testing or note taking or doing any kind of scientific thing. Like we were just kind of all picking it up and going with it as we could and swapping notes. So um wanted to go to Homesteaders of America that fall. And a friend of mine had a booth and she said, you know, I know you've been kind of playing with some sheet milk soap. Would you want to bring that and sell it at my booth? Um, Cause I've never worked a booth before. I need a booth buddy. So like, this could be your incentive. And I'm like, okay, sure. So that was fall of 2021. I mean, it sold like hotcakes and yet that's not something that you find very often. No. And, and folks were really curious about sheep for milk. And so we went the following year to Homesteaders of America and um, that same friend gave a presentation on wool sheep and she mentioned you can get milk from wool sheep. And so at the question and answer time, half the questions were about sheep for dairy. And she was like, I don't raise sheep for dairy. I just know that you can. And so finally <laughs> she looked at me and I nodded and I looked at her and she nodded. And so I just stood up in the middle of her presentation and I'm like, okay, come talk to me. Cause I do milk sheep. I know what I'm talking about ish. Um, I'm learning. So yeah. So here's yeah. my booth. Well, I mean, we were swamped after that with folks wanting to know about sheep daring. And so, um, you know, my husband and I were like, well, why don't we like write a little pamphlet or something about sheep dairy and I'll interview some of the folks I know on the sheep dairy boards and we'll just kind of try to get the word out. And the lady who we were next to in the booth, she was like, well, I'm actually starting a publishing company. Would you want to write a book about it? And I'm like, Sure. So I have folks asking me now, like, so how do you find a publisher and like all this thing? And I'm like, I don't know. Okay. I literally <laughs> slipped on a banana peel and ended up with a book on it. Okay. So That's amazing. Not... <laughs> I do Jeez. markets too. And I have made the best connections with other vendors. Yeah. Like my business would never be what it is without meeting people at markets. It's so interesting. I love people that build other people up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the vending community in the homesteading world is just the, I mean, that's, that's half the reason why I go to these events is for the other vendors. Cause it's oh, yeah. just a wonderful experience. So. Oh, that's amazing. So that led you to writing your book. Yes. Yeah. And then that's led to speaking engagements and, you know, it's, it's just been a very interesting God thing of how this has all come about, but yeah. So, um, there is me in a nutshell. So it's in a nutshell, that's amazing how it just played out. So you mentioned to me that sheep is considered the original dairy animal. Right. So in the um, archaeological digs where they found pottery shards with what they consider to be the oldest milk storage that we have record of, they've done chemical analysis on that milk residue and they think it is actually sheep milk. Wow. Because yeah, so, like it's just one of those things that we've probably lost. It's not a popular dairy animal. Well, in our country, overseas, in True. some areas, they are a far more popular dairy animal than any of the other ones. So, you know, and it, there's a lot of politics in our country. The cattle industry really did attack, and I do mean that in the literal sense of the word, the sheep industry. And so, um, I mean, in my area, you know, people just are like, oh, well, sheep are stupid. You know that, right? But apparently, if you go out west, like, there's still a very strong anti-sheep culture. Like, you're called names if you're a shepherd. Like, it's it's weird. So, oh. You know, the the more I get into alternative lifestyle stuff, like eating clean and not going to the doctor if I have a sniffle and that kind of stuff, the more I find out like there's several areas in our country that I thought were accidental and it turns out they were very proactive. So, I mean, there was an actual campaign in both our country and in England during the Industrial Revolution to move sheep to the wayside and move agriculture towards cows. And there was... There were some legit reasons for that. And there were some rather nefarious reasons for that too. So, man, I'm such a history nerd that that just fascinates me. So I could go all the way down that rabbit hole. Oh, there's so many bunny trails <laughs> and like rabbit holes when you start getting into sheep. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh, so. that's amazing. So what do you think as far as sheep dairying in America, mm -hmm. what are some of the misconceptions or challenges that you think that people might believe about that type of dairy animal? Well, I mean, the first one is that sheep are stupid. Um, the second one is that wool is a nuisance and it's terrible and it's scratchy and it's high maintenance and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I used to think that goats were far more parasite hardy and just more hardy in general than sheep. It turns out sheep are actually much more hardy than goats. Um, I bet. You know, I have a couple of just like pet goats pretty much mm -hmm. that I thought I was going to milk and that didn't pan out. Uh, <laughs> imagine that. But 
I, I've told this little story before on the podcast too. You mentioned them getting out, goats getting uh-huh. out. We talked to our local ag agent and my dad was like, well, what kind of fence do you recommend? This is probably 20 years ago. What kind of fence yeah. do you recommend for a goat? And he was like, well, one that's waterproof because that's the yeah. only way you're going to keep them in. <laughs> going to get out no matter what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, sheep are not like that. I mean, I've had some sheep escape from fencing, but it was only because either the ewes wanted the ram and that happens more often than the ram wanting the you, ironically. Oh, um, or their paddock was was done, like they'd eaten everything and they wanted new food and I just hadn't gotten to it fast enough. Or um, we had quarantined a new you we had just purchased and she decided she did not need quarantine anymore. So she jumped an eight foot fence and joined the rest of the flock. Oh, and I was like, okay, exactly. you know, just have fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not going to argue with you. <laughs> oh, so, man. So... Uh, Okay. That's really interesting to me. Cause I think I, I kind of probably had that misconception too, is that sheep are just less hardy in my mind. They're more finicky. Yeah. Hmm. Right. No, they're actually more parasite resistant than goats. Um, you know, goats seem to think they're made out of sugar. If they get wet, they'll melt and mm-hmm. sheep are the opposite. They, I mean, I've had sheep who will fight me to stay out in the elements. They do not want to put in the barn. So, you know, sheep can get wet and sheep can get cold. If they get cold, wet with wind, they can get pneumonia. But I mean, you know, if it's, if it's a really bad snowstorm, they love just curling up. The snow will snow on them. Their wool insulates them. And then they get up in the morning and shake it all off. And it's beautiful and picturesque and they're fine. So. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. So besides their pasture management mm-hmm. issue, you know, characteristics, what are some of the differences between sheep's milk, goat's milk, cow's milk, as far as nutrition wise, because you mentioned you got into this for health reasons, which is how mm-hmm. most of us fall down this homesteading rabbit hole. Right. <laughs> yes. right. So what are some of the key differences there? So pound for pound or, or gallon for gallon, sheep milk will always make more cheese than goat or cow milk because of the fat and the protein. Um, it has the lowest amount of lactose. So it is the most similar to human breast milk of the three milks. So actually in India, they're doing studies where they're giving infants sheep milk instead of formula for failure to thrive infants. And the infants are actually doing better on the sheep milk than formula. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that's another rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. We won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> time in the day. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll be here a long time if we do, but uh, it is much higher in minerals um, with when I looked at the different like studies and stats, you know, the milk components typically change based off of region of the world, what the pasture forages were and what the breeds were. But on average, the sheep milk had two to three times all the nutrients that cow milk had. And then typically the same with goat. Now goat milk does have more immunoglobulins than sheep milk does, which means it will boost your immune system production, I think. Um, But it's everything else nutritionally wise, sheep had more than goat milk. Oh, okay. And so as far as quantity, like how does that compare to milking a goat or a cow? Well, of the three sheep produce the least amount. So okay. you are getting a real big punch in a small package. <laughs> yeah, so, <there> you go. <laughs> so, you know, and I think that's part of the reason why it hasn't, the, another reason why it hasn't become really popular in our country is because overall agriculture wants bigger, better, faster, fatter, cheaper, yeah. and sheep milk just die under those circumstances. So you really can't do a mass production factory farm situation with sheep because they'll just die. Um, so, you know, that being said, you get a healthier product, but, um, on my really crappy pastures, um, uh, my dairy crosses will give, about a quart and a half. So upwards towards a liter. But like I said, I have really, really, really bad pastures. Like they're worse than I thought they were. <laughs> oh, no. So I think as our pastures improve, I can expect a solid liter from them. Now, if you get high percentage East Frisians, which are like the Holsteins of the sheep dairy world, you can get a gallon a day from those girls. And you know, especially because we're kind of talking for the small scale farmer or homestead or backyard sheep is what I have in my mind. Anyway, that's kind of the audience here. I don't see that as a bad thing necessarily. Like I see some of these people who are getting four gallons a day and unless you're selling it, which is a, you know, if it's legal where you are, blah, blah. um, How in the world do you go through that much milk? I don't think I can keep up. I think that would be more of a burden than a blessing to me to have to manage four gallons a day of milk. Right. So we do have a Jersey cow to feed the other livestock on our farm and to get butter. Um, Well, John and Beth's daughter are smart. I just copied them. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, uh, you know, and it, it, when you have a cow and you're getting that much production, you need a whole separate fridge for all that volume. Um, you know, now with, with sheep milk, the cheese, I, I will fight people over this fact is better than any cheese you will ever have from any other species. Um, with the possible exception of water, buffalo mozzarella, but that's another thing. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. I don't think you I've can ever milk a lot animal. more animals than you thought. Right now, <laughs> like, you remember? Was it meet the? Um, oh, what was it with Ben Stiller and the? Oh, meet the parents. Like you, yeah, you can milk anything with nipples. <laughs> Well, yes, actually, I mean, I thought that at the beginning, and I was like, "Don't go there, Caitlin." But we went there. <laughs> well, I, I mean, when you talk about dairy. You just enter into kind of anatomical <laughs> worlds you never thought possible. But yeah, okay. no, my sister has milked a cat. There's a company in Italy that has a pig milk cheese for sale. I mean, if it lactates, you can milk it. Well, um, I actually have a friend whose baby had some eczema issues and she tried donkey milk. I've, I've heard of that. That's yeah. The whole thing. I had no idea. I would never think to milk a donkey. That's the one animal. Well, camel milk, milk is actually a really big thing for people with autism. It helps alleviate the symptoms. Wow. So we actually yeah. have been dealing with some Lyme and COVID issues with my husband's health. And we are currently importing camel milk um, from Missouri. He just tried sheep milk, yogurt, ice cream last week, and he was fine with it. So I'm very excited when our sheep fresh and he can switch to sheep milk because that is infinitely cheaper than camel milk. So, but yeah, I, I mean, you can only imagine <laughs> you can milk a lot of things. So. <laughs> this is great. Oh my goodness. Okay. I don't even remember what the question was, but we got, <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I just Throw another one at me. We'll see where we go. <laughs> um, okay. So you mentioned that you have a Jersey cow for butter. So yeah. do you not do butter with sheep's milk or do you just prefer? No, you can do butter with okay. sheep's milk. Sheep milk is naturally homogenized like goat milk. And so like if I leave my sheep milk in the fridge for like a week and a half, there will be like a centimeter or maybe an inch of milk of cream on top that I can hand skim. But if I am trying to get cream out of like a gallon or two of sheep milk, I will use a cream separator. Um, okay. So our thing was just you know, we were, we were feeding pigs and chickens and dogs and cats. And so I figured since we have this volume, I'll just get more butter because that was mainly what I was cooking in was butter. Mm -hmm. And so I had the sheep butter for like bread and then the cow butter for ghee and cooking and that kind of thing. Okay. That makes sense. So there's definitely like a, a more of a cream content for cow's milk, you think? Or no, I mean, sheep, sheep milk has higher cream content. Okay, it's, it's just, it's harder to access. So okay. like if I have, if I'm hand skimming, I will get like 10% of the cream available in the sheep milk versus if I'm using a cream separator, you know, I can get maybe, I think a, a quart of cream per gallon is what I got one time. Oh, wow. so, okay. Yeah. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. So that's stuff yeah. that if you didn't know this, I mean, yeah. just like when you started, how in the world would you know that? That's why you had to wrestle. Well, and no one could tell me. Dairy. So, I mean, like, yeah. you know, and, and most of the dairy shepherds didn't know where to get a cream separator and couldn't afford it when they figured it out. So, you know, I just have this skill of making friends with internationals. So I found this Ukrainian lady who had a, a, a cream separator company. And I was like, I'll help open up more American markets <laughs> if you hook me up and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I just tend to think if it's not local, where do I expand to? And I, like I said, I was on the mission field. I'm very comfortable talking to internationals. And so it's just funny how the Lord uses your life experiences yeah. down the road as an adult, because I was like, why don't any of these dairy shepherds just hit up the Eastern Europeans that they know? And my husband's like, well, honey, most of us don't have a couple Eastern Europeans in our back pocket. That's what right. <laughs> oh, okay. We don't have friends over there. <laughs> it's so funny. But that's amazing that, you know, your experiences, it just seems like, you know, once you're not the end, but further along yeah. in the journey and you can kind of look back and see how things work out. It's always amazing yeah. to me. So that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So you made a mention of how they're using sheep's milk with infants who have failure to thrive and, can you elaborate on how, you know, nutrition wise, do you want to dive into that? That's yeah, so, well, so I am a certified nutritional therapist or I had a certification. I let it go in 2020 because reasons, but yes. Um, <laughs> so yes, no nutrition. When I find someone who's like, could you talk about nutrition? I'm like, Oh, you have no idea what you've just done. <laughs> My <laughs> best friend is a nutritionist or, okay. And, and I'm actually hanging out with her after this, but it's so funny. Every time we get together, we just like, you know, yeah. you have to talk about it. So you I'm have to. I mean, if when you find that nutritional kindred spirit, you just yes. are like, 
So yeah, so with the sheep milk, the fat globules are actually differently shaped than a cow fat globule. Um, they're smaller, they're smoother. And so um, that combined with the low lactose means that it will not ferment in your gut and it moves through it more quickly. And so you don't have the fermentation issues that a lot of people have with cow milk that makes them think they're lactose intolerant. And I'm just going to say it. If you fart after you have cow milk, you're not lactose intolerant. You have faulty digestion. Um, if you're lactose intolerant, what that means is your body does not produce lactase, which is an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is a sugar. So if you have a high lactose product like cow milk, um, you, you, if your gut is compromised, your body is trying to digest that, but it's having a hard time. So, you know, I used to get, I mean, I'm, an, I'm, I love dairy stuff. I'm German by heritage, like butter goes on everything. And if it's not butter, it's cheese and cream. Right. Um, and I would, <laughs> so, I mean, I would get horribly bloated. I mean, you know, flashlands was a thing or burping and that kind of stuff. And I don't have any issues of that kind with sheep milk. Now, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm German by heritage. And then also my family claims Prussia as their country of origin, which does not exist for anyone curious, but it's where Poland is now. <laughs> okay. And so my maiden name, when I looked it up, um, the region of Poland that it's from is famous for its sheet milk cheese. Wow. That's full circle. Full yeah. Circle. So, I mean, it's just kind of funny because, you know, sheep were the peasant common person's dairy animal for hundreds of that or thousands of years. Yeah. And so, you know, if, when you look at the chemical construction of sheep milk or, or goat milk or cow milk or camel milk or water buffalo milk or all, you know, donkey milk, <laughs> you know, I do <laughs> all the things, all the There's a lot more than we, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think, a lot of our issues in modern day health is that we've left our ancestral diets. And so our genetic memory is going, I don't know how to process this. I mean, you know, I am not from high class, you know, European stock. I'm from good peasant stock and the peasants had smaller ruminants. And so I think that's a big part of it is that just there is something to be said about genetic memory and our bodies being more assimilated to certain foods than others. So Absolutely. And it makes total sense. And I think when you, you know, going down the nutrition rabbit hole and you really start looking into that type of diet, it makes sense. We're not, we think that we know what we're, well, we have come a long way, but I don't necessarily right. know that it's. We've gotten smarter in some ways and stupider in other ways. That's yes. all I like to be <laughs> That's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting. And, you know, now that you mentioned it, like I hadn't really thought about the European side of things, but I've, I've been to Germany. There are sheep all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just don't see that as much here. So yeah. how can, in your opinion, a small farm, maybe they already have an existing setup. What would be the easiest way for them to incorporate sheep? Like as far as the pasture that's required, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure, how would you suggest they incorporate sheep? So I'm actually at this moment writing an ebook, uh, bringing your new sheep home, where I'm I'm going to address some of that kind of stuff. So because I have my I have my big book on you know the guide to homestead dairy sheep, which was here's all the general things, but the book I wanted to have when I started. Um, and I'll link it in the show notes, by the way, because it is an incredible resource. It's so good. Oh, thank you. And, and when I wrote that, I mean, again, I was starting from ground zero. There were no, there was one book on sheep dairying and it's out of print. So, I mean, I was basically making it up as I go. So since then I've gotten more messages from people about specific things. So I'm trying to kind of hit on those specific things with eBooks. And then I will write a second book where I expound even further on that. So anyway, but when you're bringing a new sheep home, what you need to realize is that they are flock social critter, critter, huh, critters. So critters, <laughs> critters sure, 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 sure. <laughs> you know, they, they can get depressed. They can get anxiety. They are on the bottom of the food chain and they really believe their safety in numbers. So I always recommend that you start off with four sheep. You get a ram and a castrated male, and then you get two ewes. And that way when they're separate, they have one buddy. And then, you know, when you go to breed, they can just all be together as a little flock. So that would be my recommendation, depending on your region, your soil, your breed of sheep, what, you know, what you're asking from. I think the ratio is it's between four and six sheep per, per acre. Oh, okay. If you want to do a grass-based um, 
management system. So one of the things I'm realizing I need to talk a lot more about is when people bring sheep home to their farm, a lot of us want to do rotational grazing and put them in electronet, which is perfectly fine. That's what I do too. However, when you first bring a sheep home, you need to establish yourself as their shepherd and they need to become familiar with their settings. Um, there's actually studies done where sheep can recognize a photograph of their shepherd after two years of not what? seeing them. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh. So they're, they're not stupid. They really are intelligent. They're just, they're not human. So they're not going <laughs> to think like a person. So um, they do a lot better when they know what to expect. So like they did a study where they flashed a light at sheep before dropping a piece of wood right next to them while they ate. And then they did the same thing where some sheep were eating and they dropped a piece of wood and the sheep actually learned when light flashes a piece of wood's going to drop and it didn't startle them anymore. What? That is mind blowing to me. Yeah. So, I mean, you can train them. Like there's old photographs of people in the Swiss Alps who have sheep pulling little carriages. Wow. That's so, you know, like, which is good news if you want to milk them because you have to train them to be milked, like to either jump up on a milking stanchion or to sit still while you're there. You can teach them to walk on a leash. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things you can teach sheep to do if you know how to interact with them. Right. But they're not going to do any of that if they have not accepted you as their shepherd. So, so how do you go about doing that? So the main thing is time. You need to spend time with them. They're, if you do the love languages, their love language is time and acts of service. <laughs> so you, they basically will see their shepherd as the head sheep. They don't see you as a human anymore. They see you as one of them because when they just see a human, they think predator. And so they're automatically watching foreign humans as a potential threat to their life. But if you establish yourself as their shepherd, they see you as a sheep. And so they're willing to do what you ask them to do. Wow. That's amazing. So, I mean, it makes sense. Spend time with them and you'll have a better yeah. connection. Yeah. But I mean, I you know, when you're about to do that. Yeah. But I mean, like in scripture, when it says my sheep know my voice, like it really is serious. When, when we had our border Lester, if someone would come onto our property that she didn't know, she had a very specific ba she would give. Like a guard sheep. Like a guard sheep. <laughs> so like <laughs> she would bomb so like, multi-purpose. They, they really are. They can guard you. They can clothe you. They can feed you. They can fertilize your garden. I mean, there's I'm all kinds sold. of things. My poor husband, he has no idea we're getting sheep after this. That's okay. I'll talk to him. I'll fix it. Okay, good, good. Like, you don't understand. I talked to a professional. We have to do this. Yeah, you really have to. Um, so, it, and the thing is, a lot of women are like, well, I can't sell my husband on sheep. I'm like, here's what to do. Knit the man a pair of socks. Oh, see, my husband is sold on wool socks. That is something so, okay. that he will spend money on is some good wool socks. So you just get you some, like knit him some wool socks and be like, here, baby, if we get sheep, just, you can have I many can of these you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I sold my husband on it anyway. So I was like, for free because it's already here. He's like, you have to feed the sock makers. But, <laughs> but well, where they're multi-purpose, like it's not right. just socks. You're getting milk and you're getting, you know, meat and you're, you know, their, their manure is cold. Like rabbit manure, you just get oh. more rabbit. So it can go directly on the garden. I did not know that. Cause so, yeah, so people... actually in the medieval era, the primary product sheep were kept for was their poop. Wow. Like it was called dunging a field. For the manure. Right. Like that's a homestead thing is, you know. Right. But man, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. So it was called dunging a field. There were actually professional field dungers that owned sheep and they would have so many sheep they kept in a certain amount of area. They put the sheep there. When the sheep left the next morning, that field was black. Wow. And, then, and, you know, and like they had, they had a management trick to it. Yeah. Like, you know, obviously yeah. sheep can do that every single night. But I mean, the other cool thing is that um, when the wool rug making industry started having factories, peasants would go collect the, like the ends or like the yarn bits that you couldn't weave into stuff. Mm -hmm. They would take that home to their fields and they would dig that wool into their garden beds or their pastures and it would improve the soil. No way. That's amazing. Yeah. So I have a friend on the Isle of Skye, Scotland, and another friend in New Mexico in like high desert. They both mulch their garden with wool and they can both grow vegetables and fruits that no one in their area can. My mind is blown. I'm getting a whole, I'm, I'm getting to, this is the cool, I like, I was already excited about this, but now I'm just sold. Wow. 
Yeah, they're, they're really amazing animals. I mean, it is really sad when you look at the politics of why they have been so ostracized in their country, because it's like this, this is the animal for the small family backyard farm garden person. I mean, yes. you can keep sheep on an acre. We have friends in Florida, like central Florida who have one acre and they keep six sheep healthily and happily on one acre and they have milk from them and they have manure for their garden. And I mean, no one knows because they're in a residential area because they're so quiet. Oh man. No, I mean, it's just, it just makes sense to me because when you get into this, you know, it, like you said, it's the gateway thing you get a right. chicken and the next thing you know, every square inch is covered in vegetable garden and all the things. <laughs> so if you have an animal yeah. that can really feed all of that process, yeah. this yeah. is one. Yeah. Man. I mean, I think, so. I mean, they are the ultimate permaculture animal and, you know, there's a lot of people in the homesteading community who are really like against wool breeds speak for lots of reasons. And I'm just going to say it. They're ignorant about those reasons. Like they say hair sheep meat tastes better. They say wool is a nuisance. It's worth, you know, it makes the meat taste differently. And I will, I will go toe to toe with anyone who says that hair sheep meat tastes better than wool sheep meat. I will take, I will pay for a lamb chop from a wool breed sheep before taking a lamb chop from a hair sheep that you give me. Cause I just think it tastes better. So, I mean, it really is your preference and, and I'm sure so much you're... of it is in the raising too. I mean, just like beef. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's like the Angus breed of, of beef had a really good PR person. And so it's like, well, I'll, t I would prefer a Longhorn steak or a Dexter steak before an Angus steak, but they didn't have good PR people. So isn't that funny. Uh, it's amazing. You don't realize that how much politics goes into. And oh, there's so much politics in our food. Yeah. Okay, man. I feel like we could do like 10 episodes just on this. There are so <laughs> many rabbit trails. You're going to have to come back on because I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay, I see so many <laughs> different directions here. And well, like and I haven't even touched on wool yet and all the health benefits that you get from wearing wool. I mean, like just a spoiler alert. My husband and I used to get horrifically sick every single winter with influenza or whatever came through. And now that most of our winter wear is wool, we rarely get sick. And, you know, most people think of wool as a winter wear commodity, but I actually just finished a tank top and wore it on the beach in central Florida in August. Oh, that's, that's telling right there. And, you and I was fine. <laughs> so it actually well, it, helped. it wicks moisture right that's my understanding it wicks moisture it's breathable I mean the only complaint I had was that the cloth was a little heavier than like a linen or a cotton or something like that which I mean that was just the needle size that I used and that I hand spun it so if I had gotten like a lace weight that would not have been an issue so I mean there's whole companies now that are making uh wool underwear and wool you know I, summer wool and sports I've been the ads for them <laughs> yeah and I mean yet. You know, I, you will be healthier wearing wool because of all the different dynamics of it. So um, linen has very similar composition to it. But I mean, at this point, I think linen is more expensive than wool is. So um, is yeah. yeah, which makes me sad because I do love me some linen too. I do too. I do too. But man, okay. So we need to have a whole other episode just on wool. <laughs> right. Mark that on your calendar because I, okay. I don't want to go down that trail with you. <laughs> Okay. Oh man. Okay. So as we wrap it up, where can listeners find your book and where can they find you? So my book is available on Amazon, um, Pella Vida, my website, which is whoopsiedaisyfarm.com. Um, or you can go directly to the publisher, which is sawdustpublishing.com. And uh, if you order it from my website, I will sign it from you. If you get it from the other places, it's just a normal book. Sorry. Oh, cool. <laughs> so cool. So cool. And Very then, uh, on my website, I do have a blog. I'm trying to update it regularly, but I have a 14 month old. And so writing is an interesting oh, adventure with I him understand. around. <laughs> uh, so my priority right now is, like I said, the eBooks on the specific topics, just to get that information available to people. Um, I have a fledgling YouTube, but between the internet and the one-year-old's don't know if YouTube is in the cards for the near future, um, but I am very active on Instagram okay. and Facebook at Whoopsie Daisy Farm. Okay. And I'm going to link all of those in the show notes because I know there's so many, you know, so many different places that we can connect these days. So yeah. your book link and I'll link it from your website also. And okay. And Thank all you. Those things. Um, okay. Any final thoughts on what you would like to share if the audience is listening and they're thinking they might be interested in dairy sheep? Any final thoughts? So the North American Dairy Sheep Association did just start this year. They just got their website and they, I just became a board member of them. Oh, um, but thank you. <laughs> so the, the founder 
is I think Liv Fox, if I'm getting my name's not crossed because I've talked to a lot of people today, but anyway, she is really passionate about dairy sheep and she's done a really good job of getting articles and uh, educational materials up for people too. So it's very young, very new, but you know, everyone on the board is very passionate about getting people connected with either shepherds or customers or getting informational, inf or getting information out there for people. So uh, that would definitely be a social media or website to check out is the North American Dairy Sheep Association. Okay. So I'll link that one too. That's a good resource to have. It's crazy that it just started. Yeah. Just this year. And I'm really wow. thankful because I was really seeing the need for that. And I was like, okay, I got to do something else. I've got to start this thing. I don't even know where to start. And then I just kind of saw it popping up on my feed and I was like, oh, well, someone else came up with that idea. And so I reached out to them. I'm like, um, I have this book and they're like, oh my gosh, we wanted to connect with you. So can you be on our board and can we promote your book and all this stuff? And I was, I was just really happy because I knew there was a need and I just didn't know if I could fit that need and someone else fit that need. And now we're working together and supporting each other. So I'm yeah, really a cool situation. Always. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, right. Cause you didn't need um, one more thing to bat off. I really did not. <laughs> there, there is the dairy sheep association of North America. So the names are very similar, but they're two different groups. Um, and the Dasana is more for, I will say a conventional dairy or a larger scale. So they have, they do have really good information. I mean, they were who I got a lot of my information starting off, but they're more focused on like, you know, feeding your sheep for maximum milk production That's or production. utter confirmation or like it's very focused to larger scale, larger farms, which is fine. I can, you know, you can still learn from them, but if you're a smaller backyard entity, the North American Dairy Sheep Association is more where you want to go. Okay. Well, that's great. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited about this. I, like, I had no idea that I needed to be a shepherdess. Would that be the term? No, you do. Congratulations. Welcome to the dark side. We have sheet milk cookies. <laughs> <laughs> sheet milk cookies? Or sheet milk caramel, I should say. Not really cookies. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Man, there's a whole world of sheet milk. I guess you can make sheet milk cookies if you've made like the butter out of sheet milk. Oh. I make my own shampoo that. and soap out of sheet milk and it is <laughs> divine. So I feel bad because I can't make it consistently. So I make it right before events. And so if you see it unstock my website, snap it up while you can, because it is amazing just tooting my own horn i'm gonna have to remember that do you have like an email list where i can sign up and get notified of this i should start a waiting list for yeah. i do an you email list on my website but i should do okay. like a waiting list for the soap yeah, so. yeah. Okay. we're launching there's only so many yeah i would probably <laughs> need to say that i want to grab that up <laughs> awesome well thank i did you. start making um taliban too out of the sheet milk fat oh. It's very nice as well. So, I mean, all of their product, all of the sheep products are, for some reason, our skin just absorbs it so much more quickly than, you know, I think, I think um, it's sheep and then lard and then cow products is how, where it goes as far as the fastness of it being yes. absorbed in your skin. So yeah. I don't know if there's any studies on that. Just my own personal observation is that's how it typically goes. That's really interesting. Cause I started with beef tallow a few mm -hmm. years ago and then I yeah. switched to lard because I heard that the pH is supposed to match skin better. So now I have yeah. to, I now you have to try sheep. Website to do sheep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we want to see another skincare episode. We just <laughs> have endless possibilities here. <laughs> Exactly. Oh man. Well, thank you so much for being on today. I just think that like you are such a wealth of information and I think this is going to go over really well. I'm sure I'm going to have more questions. So, okay. Sounds <laughs> great. Well, I'm shoot messages. always happy to be a podcast guest. So. Well, I appreciate that so much and I'd love to have you back on. So we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.